Um, there's all kinds of, of, of revelations and stuff that you probably haven't come across before. And it's definitely a class that's going to make you walk away scratching your head and something to reflect on for a good little while, hopefully. Uh, just a little bit of a, a quote to kind of set the tone for this class. During the sexual ecstasy, the couple is surrounded by a tremendous and terribly divine energy. In these moments of supreme joy and ardent kisses that inflame the depths of the soul, we can retain that marvelous light to completely purify and transform ourselves. When we spill the glass of Hermes, when the loss occurs, the light of the gods depart, leaving open the door so the red and sanguineous light of Lucifer can enter. I'm not going to explain that one because the course of today's lecture is going to explain that in its entirety. So, let's go. Okay, we talked about the three factors for the revolution of the consciousness. Um, we're always talking about, you know, fighting and war and revolution. Why don't we use these terms? Uh, why don't we use the term revolution in, in, in regard to a change of consciousness? The path to intimate self-realization of the being, which is a long and complicated way of saying awakening the consciousness, that path is revolutionary. Okay, when you're undergoing a revolution, you're fighting the forces that are in place, right? Think of a country undergoing a revolt or a revolution, there's a government in place, they're trying to overthrow them, they're trying to go against the order of things. That's what we're trying to do, because to awaken a consciousness is a revolution. Okay, because the powers that are in place, the forces of nature, are keeping us bound to that wheel of samsara. We've become trapped on that wheel, and it's necessary for us to, to undergo a revolution of the way we see things, to fight to awaken that consciousness. Remember the process of, of evolution and just, you know, naturally being human from existence to existence. There's nothing about that process that's going to create an automatic awakening of the consciousness. We actually have to fight for that. We have to undergo this revolution. Okay, so the revolution that we're talking about, the awakening of the consciousness, we have to remember it goes against nature's laws. I'm not talking about mother nature here, I'm talking about nature the machine, if we can think of it that way. I'm not specifically talking about uh, the creative force or, or a goddess or something like that when I talk about nature. I'm talking about the universe as a whole and all the mechanical laws contained therein. We're trapped, we're part of that machine, and we have to break free from that. Remembering that the revolution of the consciousness, the awakening of the consciousness, it is opposite to common everyday life. Okay, and it goes against what most of humanity does and thinks. Especially the times that we're in now, the times of Kali Yoga, we'll talk more about that when we get into phase B. Um, when we look at the process of evolution and involution, the human race uh, has been around for a long time. This particular race, the race we're in right now, has been around for a long time and it's getting near the end of its existence. What we find now is a lot of uh, involutionary forces. We see a lot of corruption, a lot of degeneration happening in society with humanity as a whole. We're actually fighting against that by trying to awake our consciousness. We're trying to escape that pull of the ego. So the, the thinking that's involved and the, the, the lifestyle and everything about awakening consciousness, it goes against what most people think about. You stop your average person on the street, they don't think about the awakening of the consciousness. They might, you know, have some sort of spiritual inclinations, but they really don't know how to go. They really don't know where to direct these, these um, curiosities or inclinations that we have. Remembering that if we're on this path, according to the law of return and recurrence, we've been on this path many times before. We're not just learning new stuff, we're really just remembering stuff we've already learned, if you look at it that way. Okay, so everything that we do on any esoteric path that leads to the awakening of consciousness, any esoteric path that leads to liberation, it doesn't matter what path you're talking about, all rivers flow to the same ocean, but it doesn't matter what path it is, that path is revolutionary. <clears throat> Revolution then, if you look at it this way, it's changing the way we used to live and the way we think. It's opening our eyes to the true reality around us. Um, and we've looked at all kinds of different practices that we can use to do that. Practice to do things like, you know, um, astrally project or awaken consciousness in our dreams and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to be learning more as the weeks to come. We have to comprehend that most of humanity, in every way, walks on the path of involution. It wasn't always the case, but in these times, most people don't awaken their consciousness. Okay, they're not really interested in developing that divine spark anymore. So many people are caught up in the illusion that's before them. So many people are caught up in chasing after that illusion. That's why we see such a materialistic society. That's why we see people, you know, going for money and power and positions and prestige and cars and things. Because that's the forces that are acting on our humanity right now. There's so many people that are caught in that trap. There's so many people that have forgotten about that inner voice, that little child inside them, and have instead directed 
directed all their efforts and energy into sustaining their ego, making more money, getting more power, getting more possessions, controlling more people, becoming more important. That's what we see as an influence in this life, especially in our culture here. Let's go rewind back a couple thousand years and let's look at the myth of the solar hero. The solar hero is something that when we look and compare different religions, every religion has their version of the solar hero. Okay, the secret to liberation and awakening has been taught to us by the life of many masters, solar heroes. Jesus was a solar hero for the Christians. Okay, Hercules was a solar hero. Perseus was a solar hero. Osiris was a solar hero. Buddha was a solar hero. Krishna was a solar hero. Muhammad was a solar hero. They all had the same thing happen. And these two guys are an interesting comparison because we think of the ancient Egyptians, they predate Jesus by roughly 2,500 to 3,000 years. Um, everyone is familiar with uh, Jesus, who's the solar hero of basically our times, basically Christianity. We know that Jesus died and was resurrected. Well, so was Osiris. We know that Jesus died on a cross. Well, Osiris didn't die on a cross, but he was cut up into four chunks and thrown to the four corners of the earth. We see the expression of the, the cross there as well. Born of a virgin mother, born of a virgin mother, born around December 25th, born around December 25th. There's a lot of parallels. There's a lot of connections between these people because they were telling a story. And the important thing is not to focus on whether it was Jesus or Cyrus or Buddha or Krishna or Muhammad or whatever. The important thing is, why do we keep having the same story told over and over and over again? Let's forget about the fighting over which religion's better or who's right and who's wrong. And let's just focus on the story because that's the really interesting thing. Because all these great masters through their life basically told the same story. That story contains the secret to liberation and the awakening of consciousness. The three important themes contained within all solar hero myths are the birth, the death, and the sacrifice. It doesn't matter whether you're talking, let's talk about Jesus, okay? Jesus, we all know his birth was a big deal. We're about to experience that big deal in a couple weeks, right? That's what Christmas is all about. Born in the manger, the star, the three wise men, born to a virgin mother, all that kind of stuff. The drama surrounding his death and resurrection, okay, that was a big thing for Jesus, obviously, and the sacrifice Jesus made for humanity. Well, if you look at the story of Hercules, Hercules also had a really interesting birth. He was half God, half man, okay? His mother was impregnated by the god Zeus, okay? He had to go through all kinds of strange trials and all kinds of horrible things. He didn't physically die, but he had a descent to the underworld, battled monsters in the underworld, and came back up. There's the death and resurrection again. And he had to make a ton of sacrifices. Uh, if you've ever heard of the trials of Hercules, that's what they were all about, the trials and tribulations and the sacrifices that he went through. Why do we keep seeing these same things over and over again? Why do all these solar heroes, solar heroes is another way of, you could call it a Christ figure, why do they all have the same story? Why do they have the same things happen to them? You know, you've got the same story, separated by thousands of years, separated by thousands of kilometers around the globe. Everybody's telling the same story. And that's the irony when you look at some of the situations we have in you know, modern society with people fighting about religion. You've got the Muslims and the Christians and the Jews. and It's the same thing. Everyone's fighting over the same story. It's kind of silly. The first factor we'll look at is the factor of birth. Because if we take the story of what happened to Jesus, if we take the story of Hercules, if you take the story of Osiris, what does this mean to us? Okay, we've all, we can talk about Jesus and Christmas and everything like that. You can talk about the circumstances surrounding Osiris' birth or, or surrounding Hercules' birth. But what do these things mean to us? How can we take that story that's told again and again and again, and how can we extract out knowledge that we can use in our everyday life? The first factor is that of birth. Okay? This is an interesting thing to start with. Human beings are not born complete. Okay? We're not born. We're not born complete. We start out with the ability to be complete, but something happens in the process. We're born without the vehicles that we should possess. We're born without the bodies in the other dimensions. We don't have that fully awakened consciousness. Okay? We're born with the seed for that inside of us. Okay? We're born with the divine spark, the fragment of our soul. We're not born fully complete. We're not self-realized. Okay? We haven't incarnated our higher self, is another way of thinking about it. Okay? The awakening of consciousness, the incarnation of the higher self, self-realization, that's all describing a spiritual process. Okay? A spiritual process. We're not born with all the vehicles that we need, which is why we're not multidimensional. 
Okay? We have the physical vehicle, we've mastered the physical vehicle, we're sitting in this right now, but we don't have full control over the astral, the mental, the council, the buddhic, and the atmic bodies. There's a total of seven dimensions that we could be interacting with, but we're only interacting with three right now, okay? because we don't have the proper vehicles. We have a lunar astral body, we have a shadow of an astral body that the ego uses, and that's what we travel around in the astral with every night. We have a shadow or a broken down version of the mental body, which is associated with our thoughts in the intellectual center. But we don't have control over our emotions and our intellect because those bodies, the vehicles we use to access those dimensions, they're not fully developed. They're in control of the ego. And we can't go to the council plane and we can't interact in the higher dimensions because we simply have no means of getting there. It's like wanting to fly in the air but not having an airplane. You can stand and stare at the sky all you want, but until you build the airplane, you're not doing any flying. This is the same kind of thing that we're looking at here. We're born without all the vehicles that we should possess, which is why we're stuck here in the physical, which is why we can't ascend and climb that ladder and go back to the source because we don't have the means of getting there. We're missing all the vehicles that we need. Okay, we're born with the physical body, which is the first three dimensions, and we're born with the vital body, which is the body we use in the etheric plane. Okay, sometimes called the vital plane. So this is the one, two, three dimensional aspect, and this is the fourth dimensional aspect. Okay, we don't have the perfect bodies that exist outside of that. Okay, what else do we have? We have the ego and we have the unawakened consciousness bottled up within the ego. So right now, sitting in that chair, you've got your physical body, which is the body you used to interact in the first three dimensions. Okay. You've got your vital body, which is the body you use in the fourth dimension. The fourth dimension is associated with time. <coughs> and sitting in that chair, you know that you have the ego, and trapped within that ego, you have the unawakened consciousness, the seed of the divine inside of us. Okay, But that seed isn't germinated because it's not getting any water, because it's not getting any sunlight, because it's not getting any nutrients, because something else is stealing all of that. Okay, Starving the little seed that we carry within. We don't possess what's referred to as the existential superior bodies of the being, okay? the higher bodies. Okay? Uh, you can also call these the solar bodies, and they're sometimes called the golden bodies as well. Okay? So we don't possess the higher bodies, the bodies that we use in the higher dimensions, which is why we find ourselves trapped in this three-dimensional existence. We, that seed was sent down from a high place, and it was planted in the ground. That seed was supposed to grow and ascend from dimension to dimension to dimension till it reunited back to the source. It's like falling off the top of a ladder and then climbing up. But the problem is we can only get up the first couple of rungs of the ladder because the rest are missing. We've got no way to get up to the top again, okay? Because we don't have the solar bodies. We don't have the golden bodies. Okay? We only have the potential for them within us. We have that seed that could grow and develop those higher bodies, but we don't have the ability to, to, to use those yet because they haven't been properly developed. Okay, We don't have fully developed astral, mental, and council bodies. And I left it at council, but really there's, there's even dimensions above that. Okay, There's the three dimensions, there's the fourth dimension, which is time, or the vital plane, or the etheric plane. Then there's astral, mental, council, buddhic, and atmic as well. We'll look at the higher ones later on. Okay. Buddha is in Buddha. Buddha was a Buddha because he reached development of the Buddha plane, but we're going to do that another day. Okay, so we don't fully have the bodies that we need to interact in the higher dimensions. What we do have is regarding the astral or mental bodies, we call them the lunar bodies. Okay, they're like shadows. Okay, they're inferior shadows of the solar bodies. If the solar body is a luxurious ocean liner, the lunar body is a canoe with a hole in it and a broken paddle. Okay? If think of it that way, the bodies are just like the vehicles we use in the higher dimensions. The problem with the astral and mental body that we carry right now is it's in an inferior version. It's just a shadow of the true body. Okay? If we look at the solar body as being that fully developed ocean liner which we could sail around the world on, the lunar body is like a canoe with a hole in it that we can barely paddle across the lake before it starts filling with water. Okay, so the lunar bodies, the shadow of the superior bodies, they're what we carry right now. We don't have these things fully developed. That's why we can't control the intellectual center. 
That's why we can't stop those thoughts, because those thoughts stream at us from the ego, and we can't stop them because we don't have control over that vehicle. It's like having a hole in a canoe and that water streaming in, and we can't stop the water because the canoe's all broken down to full of holes. We can try bailing out the water as fast as we can, but it's still going to seep in. Okay, it's the same way with the astral and mental bodies. The astral is related with obviously the astral plane and the emotional center. The mental body is related with the mental plane and the intellectual center. And that's why we have a hard time controlling these things because they're really tools of the ego. You can think of the lunar astral and mental bodies as like a coat or a cloak that's worn by the ego. Because that's basically how it works for us. Yes? Um, I was wondering, I've been reading a lot of the the Gospels do. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why the lunar and water and all these like feminine energies like nature yeah. that are so positive on one side are always associated with evil and sea and like that. Oh, the, the water is not. The feminine. I was reading like, oh, what's born out of evil, water, the moon, all these feminine energies, why are always associated with evil, even in myths? There's, there's like there's like there's two kinds of water. There's like a dark water and there's like a light water. So I wouldn't necessarily think of that. And the moon has two sides, there's a light side and a dark side as well. Um, part of a lot of the um, especially when you look on the Christianity side of things, they did a really good job of trying to make sure that anything related to women and women in power was turned into a negative thing. That's why when Jesus Jesus had Mary Magdalene, right? That was Jesus' wife, and this is gonna be important for us today. Um, how the early Christian church treated that was, well, we can't have him with a wife, so what's the worst thing you could say and call a woman, right? A prostitute, a whore, that's what his wife became. Um, in the early days of Christianity, Christianity was a political movement used to basically unite a bunch of warring tribes. And before Christianity came along, guess who was in power in all the tribes? It was women. Women always had the power position, so Christianity did a huge job of trying to erase the influence of women. And if you even look at the story of the original sin, it was Eve, you, you made us eat the apple. They were totally innocent. It was the women that started this whole thing, right? So that's probably where that comes from, because there's nothing that I've come across in any um, deep esoteric stuff that looks at, at anything feminine as, as negative. Um, we always look at it the other way around. And as we'll see after today as well, the Gnostic viewpoint, um, man needs woman to raise himself in the waking consciousness. So we'll get there in a few minutes. Yes? As in yin yang, like the negative is the positive baby slide. Because that's, a, I got a little bit of that message from the Gnostic Gospel. You know, yeah. I was reading it, like I, I felt, like yeah. I was like, why is a feminine always associated with that kind of stuff? What, sometimes it's called negative, but it's not negative. It's the opposite of one polarity, right? Because usually man is seen as the, the positive polarity and woman is seen as the negative polarity. And I don't mean positive is good and negative is bad. I mean that wire uh, outlet has a positive and negative. It's just two opposing currents. And the man was given the, the masculine current and the woman was given the feminine one. So negative doesn't mean bad. It's just like what it's got. Like yin and yang, it's black and white. Well, we think black is bad and white is good, but just two opposing states. That's all. Uh, so the egos live within the lunar bodies. Um, that's why they sometimes call the lunar bodies the bodies of desire. So the egos basically use our lunar astral body, our lunar mental body, as their own vehicles. Okay, and we've talked about that before, and that's the state most of humanity finds themselves in. And that's why when you look into um, uh, studying any esoteric stuff, we often talk about the bodies of desire. Okay, because it's through these bodies that basically the ego sustains itself, right? We want and desire everything. Different fa fantasies and all that kind of stuff. Uh, we can't act consciously in the superior worlds because we don't possess the solar vehicles. So we can't go to the council world to uh, where the uh, law of karma is governed. Okay, It's difficult for us to, to reach that vantage point, to view the book of our life, to have an idea of what kind of karmic debt we have. That's why we can't uh, also converse with the great masters and learn in the superior dimensions, because we have no way of getting there. It's like we're standing on the edge of a lake, and this is the way the Tibetans looked at it. They looked at it as the other shore, the other side of the lake. We're on one side of the lake, and we know that there's a really great party on the other side, and people are learning a lot, and it's a really great life, but the river's too fast, and it's too deep to swim. We don't have anything to get across. If we build ourselves a power boat, we can jump in, turn the motor on, and fly across the river to the other side. It's the same kind of analogy. We're missing, missing the bodies that we need, or the vehicle, to get us from one dimension to the next. Okay? 
We can't incarnate our being, our soul, until we have these bodies. Now, the awakening of a consciousness, the self-realization, comes by the development of the solar bodies. comes by developing the golden bodies. Okay? When we think of Christianity, Christianity tells us everybody has their soul. Everybody has a soul. You just do what we say, and you get to keep it. That's kind of unique to most a lot of the world's religions. The soul is often seen as something that you had to earn through living properly, by living the right life and doing the right things. A soul is like a reward that you got at the end of an existence. Um, Christianity is one of the first religions that kind of said something a little bit different and said, well, you start with it, providing you do all these things, you get to keep it. Because really that's Christian. I keep pick on Christianity a lot today. I don't mean to. But that's their, that's their bargaining ship, right? You don't want to go to hell. You don't want to go to hell, so you got to do what you say, because if you don't, then you go to hell, and you'll, you know, you'll lose your eternal soul. That's one of the things that they really like to, to, to spend a lot of time talking about. We have the, uh, the essence. The essence is the seed. When that seed germinates, the tree that it would turn into is the soul. So think of the soul as the oak tree. The essence that we have is the acorn. We all have a part of it, a fraction of it, that can grow and develop, but we have to put it in the right conditions for it to grow and develop. But without it, we just have the, the potential to develop that higher self, the potential to develop that soul. We all have a piece of it in us, but that piece could grow to be a lot more. That tiny divine flame that you know is flickering inside of us, that could be a raging fire if we knew how to stoke that flame. When we look at the first factor of the revolution of the consciousness, we have to look at the resurrection myth. Okay, so we see Jesus and all these people, we see them die and then they're reborn. Okay? And even the, when we look at the myth of, let's say, the life of Jesus or even the life of Hercules, they're always born into strange circumstances as well. Jesus, of course, was, was born to a virgin. Um, it's an interesting thing to look at. I'm picking on Christianity again. Um, when you go to the original Catholic doctrines, right, it doesn't say that Mary was a virgin. It says Mary was free from sin. Now, we assume that to mean that she hadn't known a man. But if you look at it a different way, if you look at sin representing ego, then that tells you that Mary was something really special. Mary was somebody who had freed herself from sin, as in awoken consciousness, eliminated the ego. Okay, so Mary and Joseph were a couple. They were a spiritual couple. They were masters that gave birth to a divine child wasn't a god that magically put a baby in her tummy kind of thing. That's just a, a common misconception of what that says. It tells us that she was free from original sin, which we now assume means well, probably that she was a virgin. But nowhere does it actually say Mary had not had sex with men before. We just have made that assumption based on what our modern society says when we talk about what does it mean to be free from sin. We assume that a woman that hasn't sinned, it must mean she's never known a man. Yes? Perhaps it's because I think that in Hebrew, Virgin and pure heart, or pure spirit, mean the same thing. Could be. Same, a yeah. Could be. Could be. But that's something that we, we think of. Um, so when we look at the resurrection myth, we look at the, these people dying and being reborn, this is what we get out of this. The first birth that we experience is our physical birth. Okay, that's what put us in this body in the first place. The second birth we experience is the spiritual birth. Okay? When Jesus died on the cross, there was one part of him that was dying and a second part of him being reborn. Because what happened to Jesus after he died and was resurrected? He immediately ascended to heaven, right? Because at that point he was a purely spiritual being. But that death was symbolic. It wasn't that we really have to kill ourselves in order to, to, to um, awaken consciousness, obviously. There was something very symbolic in that. Okay, same thing when we look at Hercules and a lot of the solar heroes, myths of the, the Greeks and Romans, they will go down to the underworld and they rescue something or fight some kind of monster and then they come back again, they come out of the underworld. That was symbolic, going down into the darkness and coming back into the light. The darkness is ending and the light is beginning. Okay, that's, that's very symbolic. Uh, this is a story, too, about birth, actually. It's kind of a funny one, because it's, it's spiritual, right? But this is all kinds of, of, of uh, symbolism hidden in this story. 
Um, one of the interesting things that I find about the Gnosis is people talk about esoteric secrets and hidden knowledge and you got to join the Masons or whatever to get all this hidden secret knowledge. The neat thing about Gnosis is if you wanted to hide something, where's the best place to hide something? Right in a really obvious place where no one would think to look, right? That's the interesting thing about Gnosis, is it's, it's all around us. You just have to look for it. Here's a children's st uh, story. Walt Disney, um, he, if you know anything about him, he, he was a mystic. He was right into the occult and esoteric stuff. That's where most of his stories came from, okay? He was repackaging some of this esoteric knowledge and presenting it in a form that was palatable to younger people, that it would speak directly to their consciousness. Okay, um, that's one of the sad things about uh, modern society. We no longer do things like you know, um, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and Pinocchio and all of these great children's stories. We no longer talk about um, parables and fables and stuff anymore. What are children watching? They're watching television shows that are usually designed to market products, right? So they're watching you know, Transformers and things that are designed to sell stuff that have lost that Gnostic imagery. So that's the little story of Pinocchio. Okay, here we go, Pinocchio. Uh, well, what do we know about Pinocchio? Well, he had this little tiny voice on his shoulder. It was a little cricket, right? That was Jiminy Cricket, and he always told him right from wrong. What does Jiminy Cricket represent? Jiminy Cricket represents the divine spark in us, the essence, our consciousness. Uh, what else do we have? We have the fairy godmother. The fairy godmother represents the divine mother. That's the force that we pray to every time we meditate. That's the feminine creative force inside all of us. Uh, we have Geppetto. He was his creator. Right? The guy that made him. His creator is the inner father and all inside all of us. Okay? What was the problem with Ego? Or sorry, with, with Pinocchio? He, he was a puppet on strings. Okay? He danced to uh, the, the wills of the puppet master. The puppet master and the fact that Pinocchio was on strings, that represents the Ego. Okay? And what was it Pinocchio wanted most of all? What did he want to be? He wanted to be a real boy. Okay? Because he was made of wood. Wood representing the physical. Okay, the earthly matter. And of all one things, of all that he wanted, sorry, Pinocchio wanted one thing most of all, and that was to be a real boy. But being the real boy was the birth of the solar bodies. Okay, the self-realization, the awakening of consciousness. And here's a silly children's story, and it's even the Walt Disney version. There's a lot of wood in that, obviously. And everything on this little cover represents that. And of course, there's the animals representing the, the forces of nature of the physical world. So there you go, Pinocchio's story, and there's every one of the elements that we've talked about. The Divine Mother, the Divine Father, the Creator, the awakening of the consciousness, the essence, the ego, the fact that the ego controls, the fact that we're not realizing our full potential. We're not real boys and girls yet. Okay, we want to be real boys. We still have this wooden body, this body of, of the material world, the body of the physical world. We want to turn that into something else. Okay, so when Jesus died and was resurrected on the cross, what resurrected was the solar Jesus, the golden body. Okay, same thing with the Buddha or uh, the story of Pinocchio or, or Hercules or something like that. Now, when we look at it this way, unarguably, the creative or sexual energies are what cause us to develop from conception through puberty to adulthood. So if you look at the energies that are happening in the sexual center, remember we looked at the five centers of the human machine, we said what was the most powerful center of all? It was the sexual center. The sexual center was like the nuclear reactor that powered the entire body, all those other subtle energies. Every energy that we have in our body is just basically a modified sexual energy. Okay? Why is the sexual center so powerful? Because it's the one that contains the energies that can create new life. So, of course, it's the most powerful. Now, when we look at the sexual energies, they're what's responsible for us to even exist in the first place. Because that's how we were conceived, through the sexual energies. How did our body grow and develop? Well, a, a, a doctor would say, well, it's because of hormones, blah, 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 blah. Which, of course, stem through the sexual center. Okay, so how did we get from a human in the first place and then go from a little baby uh, through puberty to adulthood? The sexual energies are responsible for a lot of that growth and development. Now, yes, there's hormones involved in there, but the way we would look at that is hormones are just a physical manifestation of some of those sexual energies. Okay? All our significant developments in our life are the result of the creative sexual energies. There's some really powerful forces in that particular center. And everything that we've had significant from the point we started to exist and a lot of the big changes in our life comes as a result of those sexual energies. There's no arguing that this is a, a huge, powerful force in ourselves, and our own lives, but also in society and humanity as a whole. We don't 
develop the superior bodies because we do something different with the creative energies. Okay? The creative energies would have been what turned that seed into that tree. Okay? The creative energies would have provided the, the power for that seed to grow and germinate. But instead, we've done something else different with the sexual energies. We haven't been able to fully grow and develop because we've done something else with those energies. We've redirected that energy another direction. Okay? We see a, a, a cycle sorry, stemming from conception, puberty, adulthood, and we assume it stops at adulthood. So we assume that the humanity kind of goes like this. It starts with when it's conceived, and it reaches a point in adulthood, and then it does this and returns back to where it came from. That's what we kind of look at as the cycle of life, right? All goes up and must come down, and that's kind of the way it is. But why do we assume that everything stops at a particular point in our life and starts going the other way? If we get caught on the mechanical wheel of nature, then yes, we find ourselves caught in that circle, going around and around and around. But that wasn't the original design, okay? You have to kind of think of it like a ladder, okay? We came from the top of the ladder, and we are deposited down here in the bottom, and all we have to do is climb back to the source. We climb the first couple of rungs, and then we fall off, and we just keep get stuck doing that process over and over again. Okay. When we look at the developments that happened in our life on this side, the re a lot of them were the result of the sexual energies. And that's interesting because the sexual energies, when properly used, would allow us to climb from ladder to ladder. Okay. From rung to rung, sorry. This physical body and the state that we have it in right now is a result of those sexual energies. That's why the biggest you know, power of everything in the universe is they say, you know, what's the biggest power? It's love, right? And look at it that way, the love that exists between people, that's capable of many great things. So much so that we can use that to get back to where we came from. We make our creative energies leave our body rather than staying inside for the continued development. We don't really know quite how to work with these energies. And instead what we do is rather than use those energies to sustain and feed the essence so we grow and develop spiritually, we use those energies to sustain and feed the ego. That's why some of the egos associated with the sexual center are the most powerful and difficult egos of all. The last, if you look at the, e the ego um, as a seven-headed dragon, which that was depicted in the story of Hercules and, and uh, Jason and the Argonauts, the last big nasty head, that's the ego of lust. Okay, because that's the one that's been feeding off of all our energies. It's the one that's been getting all our energy, so it's the biggest one, the nastiest one. Unfortunately, we don't know how to use the creative energies properly. The ego has basically been taking and sustaining itself with this energy. Consequently, that energy isn't being directed to the essence. So the essence never grows and develops, so we find ourselves just caught on that cycle. We can learn to use the creative energies direct into the essence, so just like we came from conception to puberty to adulthood, we would keep climbing. <clears throat> After the physical body, this body here matures, I could then go on to build the next body. After that body matures, I could then go on to build the next one and keep going up the scale until we get all the way back to the top again. The problem is, once this physical body matures, we really don't know what to do. So instead, we just keep directing that excess energy to the ego, not to the higher self. Okay, so we never really get beyond this physical body. And then eventually this physical body wears out, and then that physical life is over, and we start the whole process again and again and again, never ascending that ladder. We waste many of our energies in lots of different ways. Okay, the, hum the human being misuses energies in all kinds of different ways. The energies, of course, being the energies associated with the five centers. Okay? Uh, we waste intellectual energy through worrying all the time. Okay? If you're an intellectual type person, if you, if you belong into that category, you waste a ton of energy through <coughs> the intellectual center. The intellectual center is obviously always going and running at full board. We spend a lot of time worrying, which wastes a lot of energy. If you're an emotional type person, you're probably wasting emotional energies through music, TV, movies, that kind of thing. Okay, you know, getting caught up in watching action, action movies and getting caught up in the fighting and the shooting and all that kind of stuff. That's expending emotional energy. Right? Same thing with going to concerts and diving around and all that kind of stuff. That's expending emotional energy. We waste a lot of our energies in different ways depending on the various egos that we have. Okay? How, where is the energy going when we waste it? Well, we're feeding it to the ego if you look at it that way. 
So when you're sitting there watching an action movie, getting caught up in the violence, and yeah, get him, get him, and hit him in the face again, and whatever, that's just directing all that energy to those various egos associated with that anger and violence and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Same thing if we're watching a drama movie, and you get caught up with the actors, and you identify with the actors, and you know, we start crying along with them. Well, that's emotional energy that's being directed at the egos. Okay, so we waste a lot of our energies through various outlets. Sexual energy is without a doubt the most subtle and powerful energy normally produced and transmitted through the human organism. Uh, and this is a quote from Master Samal speaking about sexual energy. Due to the tremendous, oh, sorry, due to the tremendously subtle and powerful nature of sexual energy, the control and storage of this energy proves to be difficult. Furthermore, its presence represents a source of immense power. It's like having a nuclear reactor inside us. We really don't know what to do with all this extra energy. We know that it's there. It definitely lets us know that it's there. Uh, but we really don't know what to do with it. It's kind of a, a, a difficult energy to understand because it's so subtle. Okay? When we talked about the speed, of the, uh, the speed at which the five centers process themselves, remember we said one of the slowest is actually the intellectual center. Okay? The emotional center is much faster than the intellectual center. The motor and instinctive are even faster. Remember your reflexes, if you fall, you put your hands up straight away, you didn't have to think about that. Well, the fastest center of them all is the sexual center. Okay, It's so fast and it's so subtle and works on such a subconscious level, we never really know what it's doing. But don't worry, marketers and advertisers have spent billions to know what it's doing, because that's why a lot of uh, marketing is directed towards the sexual center. Because marketers and um, advertisers have done enough research over the course of uh, the last 100 years or so to know the role that the sexual center plays and knows how subtle it is. So you play with the right kind of imagery, you trigger the energies in that center, you're going to be able to influence the way people basically live their lives and buy things and all kinds of different decisions. Rather than use our creative energies to develop the superior bodies, we eliminate the energy from our bodies in another way. Okay? When we think of the, the sexual act itself, the orgasm represents a huge expenditure of energy. And I don't need to tell anybody that, right? That's kind of obvious. There's a lot of different energetic things happening at that point in time. Okay? If we think of that process, it's, imagine it kind of like a, a short-circuiting of a battery. Okay, you're having a sudden massive release of energy concentrated in a single point in time. Okay, that's for well, a lot of us, that's what the sexual experience is. Uh, these two things, of course, apply to, to both male and female as well. This we tend to think of a, um, a, a, a male version of it, but it's the same idea. It's, it's a loss of energy. Okay, for a male, it just happens to be a, a physical association of a loss of energy. But females experience a loss of energy in the same way. That's what this, the whole process of orgasm is. It's a, a huge release of energy. Okay, so we look at it that way. Just the orgasm we experience in the sexual connection, that's the release of a massive amount of energy. And I think there's no way that would argue that one. Right? That's kind of an obvious one. Sex in the sexual center is a very powerful force. Males carry one polarity, females carry the other. With their union, the two polarities combine to create. Okay, when a man and woman are united, you've got one polarity of the energy combined with the other polarity of the energy. Now there's the ability to be something created. Okay, that electrical outlet, there's a positive terminal and there's a negative terminal. As long as those two terminals aren't connected to each other, nothing happens. They both have the potential for energy to flow. The second I plug something in, like uh, that data projector, it creates a point across those two terminals for energy to flow, and now we get something that's created. A man and a woman both carry two opposite polarities. When the man and the woman are in the sex act itself, they're united. When they're joined, now we've created a circuit, and energy is flowing. Okay, just like that electrical outlet. When the out nothing's plugged in, you've got the potential for a flow of energy. Okay? The second you connect those two terminals with a light bulb or a stereo or a TV, now you've got a flow of energy. And that flow of energy is capable of doing work. It's capable of transforming something. Whether that's turning electricity into light, whether it's turning electricity into heat, whether it's turning it into pictures on a screen, whether it's turning it into a motor that moves, it doesn't matter. Once those terminals are connected, we then have a flow of energy that we can utilize for a purpose. The sex act itself is the very same thing. 
Think of sex like charging a battery. Okay, when a man and a woman are engaged in the sex act, you've got a massive amount of energy that's flowing. Okay, they're generating a lot of energy. Okay, you can think of it like a battery. You can then use that energy to do something else, or you can short circuit and immediately lose the energy. So when a man and a woman are united, there's a flow of energy there. There's a massive flow of energy that's building up around the couple. Okay, so much so that it's actually visible in the astral. Okay, there's a lot of energy that's building up around them. Now there's a choice of what we can do with that energy. Okay, if we end up going the route, which most people go, if we end up going to the route of orgasm, that's a huge short circuit. It's like taking a battery and then putting a, I don't know if you've ever known anyone that's done this, if you're working on a car and not being careful and you drop a wrench across your car battery, you're going to discover the wrench actually welds itself to the battery in a big explosion of sparks. That's a short circuit. Okay? We've got two options. We could short circuit, which is what we're familiar with. That's the orgasm. The other option we have is to retain that energy, keep that battery charged, and then use that charged battery for something else. Okay? The restrained desire, well, there's an important term here, transmute the sacred energies. The energy crystallizes into the solar bodies. The reason why we don't have the solar bodies is because the battery that would run them is empty. We don't have to charge it. Okay? Sometimes we get close to charging it, but then we immediately discharge it, leaving it always in an empty state. It's like trying to start your car with a dead battery every time. If you charge that battery up and leave it charged, then you have the ability to do something else. Okay, I don't know why I keep going to the battery thing. It's what makes sense in my mind. It's kind of a, I've managed to make sex look like a car battery. I apologize for that. But it's a good analogy. Okay, the sex act itself is creating a huge surplus of energy. Okay, what do we do with that surplus of energy? We don't know. The ego has told us what to do with that surplus of energy. Because guess where that energy goes when we discharge it? It goes right to the ego. Okay, that huge, the orgasm itself, that huge movement of energy is basically from the sexual center directly into the ego in one massive jolt. And we experience that as the orgasm. Okay, the other option that we have is to not reach that point. Okay, to basically stop the sex act before that point reaches. That leaves us with a surplus of this incredibly powerful energy. What happens to that energy? Well, what happens to that energy is it crystallizes or it doubles in frequency to a higher octave, to another dimension. That energy that we then keep in the physical body goes on to feed the vital body until the vital body is developed, which will then go on to the astral, then the mental, then the calcil. In order to become a god, in order to become a divine spark, in order to become an angel, a deva, everything starts in the physical. This is the, the, you can think of this as the, uh, the womb where all the divine beings are gestated, the physical world. That's the meaning of life. That's why we're here. Okay? We were put here to awaken consciousness and ascend back to the source. Ironically, the seeds of the divine begin in the physical. We need the physical body because we need these energies. And we need to transmit these energies from a higher and higher octave developing the solar bodies as we go. Now, it sounds like a, a strange thing to talk about, So, because what I'm basically saying here is, with the sex act itself, that's a, an incredibly important key to awakening the consciousness. It's an important tool. It's part of the process. It always was part of the process. We're talking about using the sexual energies to basically take uh, the physical body that we have and then transform those energies into the vital body then transform them into the mental, the causal as we go up the ladder building the solar bodies. It sounds like a, a strange thing. Yeah, you probably haven't come across this before but you know what? That's not a Gnostic thing. It's something that's been around. That is the greatest secret that humanity has. That's the one missing piece of the puzzle that a lot of people are missing. This teaching has been known to many cultures under all kinds of secret names. That's what alchemy was. People are still looking for the secret ingredient to turn lead into gold. It was never about making lead, some metal, into gold. You know what? In the earlier times, lead and gold, they were just as important. Lead was actually better than gold in many instances because lead was softer and you could work with it easier. Okay? Gold is really important to us now, but hundreds of years ago, 
lead, they did stuff with lead. You could build all kinds of things with lead. Lead was a useful metal. We think of lead as a garbage metal and gold as something that was worth money. But you know what? Go back a thousand years, it didn't really make much difference. Okay? What is alchemy? Alchemy was turning lead into gold. What did lead represent? The lunar bodies. What was gold representing? The solar bodies. What did you need in order to turn lead into gold? You needed the mercury. What was the mercury? The sexual energies. What's the missing ingredient? Nobody knows what the hell the philosopher's stone was. They can try to recreate the experiments, but it never works because the missing ingredient is the philosopher's stone. We don't know what chemical or material the philosopher's stone was. The philosopher's stone was an analogy for the sex act itself. All the alchemical texts were was a, a, a way to take the knowledge and hide it. Because could you imagine trying to talk about sexual energies in the sex act in like the 800s or the 1200s? You'd be burned alive for you know heretics and blasphemy and pornography and all kinds of stuff. So the alchemical texts, they were a way to hide the knowledge. All the great alchemists were people awakening consciousness. Okay, and the, the crucible that you needed for alchemy, the crucible that everything had to be in order to develop, the crucible was a symbol for a woman's womb. That was the crucible where all the ingredients had to be placed in order for the gold to appear. So all the alchemical texts, when you go back with these things in mind, they suddenly take on a whole different light. These things were a way to talk about sex and the sex act in a time when it wasn't possible to talk about that. Uh, the Hindus culture, they had the Saha Maituna, which was their sex act. And we we're all familiar with the Karma Sutra, right? You look at the Karma Sutra, you think the Hindus are like, boy, there's some pretty horny people. Man. All their temples actually were covered with idols of sex acts. You go to some of their temples and the walls, there's carvings of people in all kinds of positions. You're like, wow, these people have got to have a good time. For them, sex and religion were basically the same thing. They weren't writing how, you know, uh, favorite position sex manuals. They were writing the way to see God. For them, it was the same thing. The Karma Sutra wasn't just a book of kinky sex positions. The Karma Sutra was a handbook, a manual to the awakening of the consciousness. And in the early days of a couple's awakening consciousness, um, it was only done in the temples in order to keep it holy and keep it magical. That's why they had the temples that were all, you know, uh, carved with all the symbolism around them. Uh, you've probably heard of tantrism before. When most people think of tantrism, they think of it as uh, trying to have sex for as long as possible, sustaining the orgasm kind of as long as you can. Well, that's basically the same thing, but we're looking at it as sustaining it indefinitely. There's a reason why tantrism was all about sustaining the physical orgasm. It wasn't just so you could be, you know, so guys could be super studs and, you know, please hundreds of women at the same time. That wasn't the idea. The idea behind tantrism was if you could sustain the physical orgasm, something else happens in its place. Something much more rewarding. For us, the physical orgasm, it's like imagine, I have all these silly analogies for this stuff. Imagine you're walking down a corridor and you pick up a piece of candy. You're like, ooh, a piece of candy, this is great. And you take a candy, eat it, and you walk away. If you'd have kept going and not picked up that first piece of candy, and if you'd have walked down the hallway and turned around the corner, there was a mountain of candy just waiting for you. But we never get there. You think of the orgasm at something a lot, it's, you know, I kind of really like that, and it's a really great experience. But you know what? There's something else that's even better than that. And that's what tantrism was all about. It was about delaying the orgasm, not just so you could go longer, but because you could go longer to reach a different state. Because that's the thing, there's a different state that we can reach with the sex act that most people haven't got to because they fall into the trap of the physical orgasm and losing the energies. That's what tantrism was all about. Uh, the Egyptians referred to it as the Arcanum AZF. Uh, transmutation is usually how we refer to it in, that, in the Gnostic context, and that's usually an alchemical symbol as well. We transmute. To transmute something is take energy in one form and convert it to another form. We're taking the physical sexual energies and converting them into something else, converting them into the energies that feed the solar bodies. Uh, working in the ninth sphere, the ninth sphere of, of, of Kabbalah, the ninth sphere is associated with the, it's associated with sex itself. Um, we can look at the ninth sphere, it's kind of it's almost the same thing as the, the philosopher's stone as well. The philosopher's stone was seen as the, the foundation of sex. And this is interesting, if we talk about the, the philosopher's stone um, being sex itself, remember Jesus, he's, the, the whole tale about the guy that built his house on sand and waters came and washed it away? 
but the guy who built his house on the rock was a different story. The rock itself was sex. Um, there's even in a, in a context too, you know the, the, the disciple Peter? Well, the, the Latin name for Peter is, is what's the Latin name for Peter? No. Petra, right? What is that? It's stone. There's a, a huge argument that says Peter wasn't Peter, Peter was sex. Every time there was a reference being made to Peter, it wasn't about some guy. It was about the sex act itself. It was a non-chemical symbol. Uh, working in the forge of the Vulcan, the forge of Cyclops, that's a, a Greek symbol. Vulcan was the one who made all the magic weapons, wasn't he? And he made them down in the underworld, and he made them in his magical forge, and if he bore these magical weapons, then he would be protected. If you look at the story of Perseus and Jason of the Argonauts, uh, Perseus, um, what did he get from Vulcan? He got golden armor that protected him and made him invisible and made him invincible. What was the golden armor? The golden bodies, the silver bodies. Uh, the vessel of Hermes. We talk about something having a hermetic seal. When you buy, you know, kitchen jars that have a hermetic seal, what do we associate the hermetic seal with? It means nothing leaks in or nothing leaks out. Well, that's kind of funny that we, we use the hermetic seal. The original ves uh, hermetic seal was, it comes from Hermes Trismegistus. He was a, a master. Um, and Hermes Trismegistus, he was the one that wrote the Codex, the animal tablet. He was the one responsible for saying for as above, so below, and explaining all these other laws. That's what the hermetic seal was. The hermetic seal is our own bodies. Okay, that nothing, that no energy was lost outside of the physical body. That's the hermetic seal. Now we use it to mean a really good Tupperware container, ironically. But applying the same idea, an airtight seal, nothing leaks out. You can think of it as the same way. The Garden of Eden and the Fall of Man is all about this. That's what it's about. In the Garden of Eden and the Fall of Man, the original sin wasn't eating the apple. The apple represented tasting the sexual energies. That was a horrible reference, I'm sorry. But that's what it was, experiencing that energy and really liking that energy. That's when we satisfied our animal passions. The snake in that context represented the ego, and the ego tempted us to experience the loss of the energies. And at that point, we became addicted to the loss of the energies. Um, that's the reason, or that's the temptation we gave into. It's the forbidden fruit. We got kicked out of Eden. What was the representation of being kicked out of Eden? We lost the superior bodies. We can no longer access the higher dimensions. Okay, so the original sin wasn't eating some apple. It was, it was taking on that forbidden knowledge, the experience of the sexual energies, and taking the sexual energies from the higher self and directing it to the egos. Okay, so the, the story of the serpent in the, the Garden of Eden represents the egos. That was the temptation we gave into. It was basically lust that we gave into and fed the ego of lust. And from that, we left the higher dimensions because we no longer use the energies to fuel the superior bodies. We found ourselves kicked out of Eden, so to speak. Okay, the original sin was the spilling of the energies, the losing those energies and feeding them directly to the ego, not keeping them to transcend or transmute on those different levels and build the solar bodies. Because if we can generate that energy during the sex act, which is like charging the battery, that's when the energy flows, that's when the energy generates. Obviously during the sex act itself, there's a lot of energy being generated there. We can do two things with that energy. We can lose it and experience the physical expression of that energy, which is the orgasm and causing all that energy to be lost and discharged or we can refrain that energy, okay? We can literally stop the sex act before reaching the point of orgasm, which is what Tantra is all about. But the difference being, the idea is if we can sustain the physical expression of that energy, we can reach a different level, okay? We can reach a different experience. We can reach a much higher level. Uh, let's go biblical, because I was picking on the Christians today, so let's, let's pull out some biblical references. Whoever has been born of God does not <coughs> sin, for his seed remains in him. What does it mean for seed remain in him? I mean, it's literally what it says. That means it doesn't spill the sexual energies. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. To be born of God means to turn yourself into a divine being, which is to develop the solar bodies. Okay? So he has been born of God. He who has the solar bodies doesn't sin because he has no ego. For his seed remains in him. For his energy is sustaining not the ego, but the higher self. And that's why he can't sin, because he's been born of God. Um, <coughs> Jesus practiced this with, Merle, with Mary Magdalene. That's what he did. Jesus was a master. Mary and Joseph, Jesus' parents, were awakened masters. They practiced alchemy. 
Okay, going back to that reference, it wasn't that Mary was a virgin, it was Mary was free from sin. How was Mary free from sin? Well, because she was an awakened master. She developed the solar bodies. Her and Joseph were working in alchemy. They gave birth to a divine child. That divine child was Jesus. Jesus also had a wife, too. That was what Mary Magdalene was. And Jesus practiced alchemy. Okay? Joseph and Mary practicing alchemy, that was the sex without spilling. That's, that's the virginal birth, if you can think of it that, that way. Okay? Technically, Joseph didn't you know, lose any fluids, so you could say, well, it's kind of virginal from that context, but it's really the same idea. The sexual force had the power to create us and is the only force that can radically transform us. We left Eden through the gates of sex and it's only through the gates of sex that we can return back to Eden. Okay, we came into the world through the gates of sex. That's how we got here. Only through the gates of sex can we leave this world. Uh, many religious symbols, they're just depictions of the sex act itself. Right? Let's go look at uh, the ank symbol. What's that look like? That's a womb, right? That's a lady's bits. What's that going into them? Well, that's the man's bits. That's the ank symbol, symbol of life. Okay, it's the, the yoni and the phallus. An even stylized version of that we see in the cross, where the one horizontal bar represented the one polarity, and the other horizontal bar crossing it represented the other polarity. So you're just seeing the union of the two forces, the positive and the negative, which are really just representations of the sex act itself, if you look at it that way. Uh, so let's clarify some stuff, because this has been an interesting class so far, right? We've compared sex to batteries and eating candy and all kinds of things. Um, if you're like me sitting in this class, which I was at one point, uh, I had a lot of questions in my mind. Um, one of the first things I was wondering is, conservation does not mean abstinence. There is a huge difference between those two terms. Spiritual chastity is not abstaining. You need male and female in order to create. So no, we're not saying you can't have sex. Sex is bad. That's not what was said at all. Sex is incredibly important. It's incredibly divine. Okay? It's just understanding how to use the energies properly to not sustain the ego and to sustain the higher self. Okay? Complete abstinence, no sex, no contact with the opposite sex whatsoever, that causes negative repercussions, and we've seen those, right? So that's why we looked at Christianity, the idea of segregating men and women. A lot of religious cultures did that. They said, okay, women and men, until you understand how to manage these energies, you have to be apart. And you can only reunite once you learn how to control the energies. And in India, it went so far as the first time they united, it was done under the supervision of a, a guru or yogi that could help them stop at the right time and help generate and move those energies within their bodies. Okay, complete abstinence causes negative repercussions. Okay, so we see a lot of uh, um, abuse of the sexual energies in our culture, everything from pedophilia to, to, to rape and, 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 and child molesting, all that kind of stuff. That's as a result of using the sexual energies in a really negative fashion. So we're not talking about abstinence here. Chastity, we look at it from that context, spiritual chastity is sex without spilling the energies. Okay, transmuting the sexual energies. Sustaining the physical orgasm to reach a different level. Okay, rather having the physical orgasm have what I could think of as a spiritual orgasm, for lack of a better term. It's an expression on a different level, a much higher level. That's what we mean by chastity. And that was the original version of chastity. Of course, in the modern times, when they say nuns and priests should be chaste, that's what they've, they've lost that knowledge because we're seeing a, a religion that's gone into a generation and they just totally segregate and they say you can't have sex at all, which causes a lot of problems because you've got one polarity of the energy that builds up and you're never actually are able to, to release that polarity properly, so it finds other um, less desirable uh, outlets. Uh, so abstinence is no sex at all, that's a bad thing. Chastity is, is sex without spilling the energies. Um, also to mention too, when we study gnosis, sex must be, um, we look at it as something that occurs between a husband and a wife. The definition of wife is, uh, and the husband are two people that choose to work together in alchemy. I'm not talking legal marriage and all that kind of stuff. Two people that decide they want to work on the path. It's something that takes time because you got to build the energies up together. It's not an instantaneous process. And it's not like, hey, the more people I sleep with, the faster I could do this. It, that was never the idea of this either. Okay? Don't forget that there's uh, karmic repercussions for adultery and sex with lots of people. Remember Kaya Sarma, or Karma Saya, so yeah, Karma Saya, where we keep uniting with people karmically that we, that we have sex with. That's an important thing to remember. Um, a husband and wife, or two people that decide that they're going to work together on this path, they need to work together for a while. 
Okay, and as they're working together, they're, they're raising their energies as a couple. It doesn't help if you, you know, have sex with one person here and then another person here and another person here. You're not sustaining any one battery. You're not building up any levels. You're just building up stuff in a bunch of different places. The energy is not all in one clear point. Okay, so, um, and that's what, that's kind of the original idea too behind monogamy. Why husband and wife should be married and should stay together because that was allowing them to really grow and develop those energies rather than building a little bit of energy over here, then a little bit over here, and then a little bit over here. That energy is not all in one cohesive unit. You just kind of spread it around. So that's that. Um, something else to mention. Well, uh, usually when you talk about to people about this, at this point they're thinking, "Well, I really, I really like sex, and, and orgasm to me is something that I, I, I enjoy. I look, I look forward to." What are, you, what are you saying? I'm not supposed to have any any pleasure whatsoever. That seems like a bizarre thing to say. But then you have to say, uh, "No orgasm does not apply no pleasure." It's the candy analogy I used earlier. This is the piece of candy that we found and we really like. We didn't realize if we held out and didn't take that piece of candy, there was something else way bigger, way better around the corner. Okay? Milsis teaches that couples who practice alchemy achieve greater levels of pleasure and deeper emotions and a more spiritual union than possible through satisfying our animal passions. Okay? So just because we're not reaching a physical area doesn't mean that it's not pleasurable. If you really haven't worked with alchemy, then how do you know? Right? That there's something else that's a, a much greater level that you can reach, and it's a way to connect with your partner that is that's a, a, a lot. It's hard to describe. It's a lot deeper. It's a lot more spiritual than just a regular relationship. When we talk about people, everyone wants true love, right? The original definition of true love comes about by couples who work in alchemy, because you're not feeding the ego. You're feeding each other's higher selves. The ego is very fluid. The ego, the one ego that swears love for a person one day, will swear love for somebody else a week, a month, a year, a decade later, right? That's one of the reasons why we see so many people having a hard time staying together in marriages. That's why we see so many failed relationships, failed marriages uh, in this day and age. It's because nobody's is working with the alchemy anymore. So no one's working with these energies anymore. You're feeding the ego. And the ego just wants more and more and more. And if I can't get it here, I'm going to get it here and here and here and here and here. And we see all the problems with that results. Uh, another question that you might have is, well, wait a sec, you tell them that humanity in the first place was supposed to do this? Because if humanity in the first place was supposed to do this, then there'd be no more people, so which point? Um, you have to remember that you don't have to spill the energies for sperm to be released. As many teenagers practicing the withdrawal method of birth control are surprised to discover. I had a friend in high school who discovered this the hard way. He thought he had, he thought he had this whole you know, concept or contraception thing beat. He was just going to make sure that he didn't actually release anything. Well, guess what? Um, that's what the immaculate conception is. Uh, for men, we don't have to reach orgasm for, it's awkward to say, for stuff to come out. Stuff comes out regardless, and that stuff is capable of impregnating a woman. That's what immaculate conception is. A child that was conceived via the act of alchemy, where the energy that's conceiving the child is in the absence of the ego. Okay, when we have a regular, this is a kind of a uh, an awkward explanation. Um, when you have a, a, when we experience a regular orgasm, there's all this energy being released, and in the astral, there's all kinds of entities literally coming in to feed off of that energy. That's the environment within which a normal child is uh, conceived, is surrounded by all that negative energy. When we're practicing alchemy, we're not sustaining that darkness, so there's nothing around except the light when the child is actually conceived. Yes? So in order to build your light, uh, well, you look at it. This goes with Kundalini. If, if you turn about raising the Kundalini, this is related to this as well. Think of that battery meter being like a scale, and the longer you do it, the the more you charge that battery. If you slip, oh, the battery goes back down. It doesn't go all the way down to the bottom. It goes back down a bit, and you have to keep trying. But eventually, if you keep losing, it's trying to fill the bucket with a hole in it, right? pouring water in, but if it's flowing out somewhere else, you, your bucket's going to drain. Okay, but it's not the case of if there was a, if you're working with alchemy and there was, you know, a, a slip up, it doesn't mean that you're right back to square one and what was the point of doing the whole thing? No, there'll be, there'll be a loss of energy depending on the magnitude of what was going on, but it's not a complete loss. It just depends how much energy you accumulated and how much you've lost. You can't make it that way. Um... The thing to mention as well, uh, something to, to imply, um, 
Gnosis itself, as I was mentioning earlier, it's not, it's not a sex thing, it's not a sex cult. I mean, that was one of the things that when I was sitting in your shoes um, and I got this class, I was like, oh, now you've done it, now you've gone and joined a sex cult. And it was me and like two other guys in the room, we're all looking at each other going, oh man, this isn't going good. There was no females around, I was like, great, I joined a sex cult and it's all guys, how did I manage this? Um, it's not like that, we don't really talk about it. And there's definitely, it's definitely behind closed doors, what you do in privacy is your own home kind of thing. And I know there's a lot of places and there's a lot of organizations where they want to be quite liberal with sex within the organization and mixing partners, all that kind of stuff. That guaranteed absolutely does not happen anywhere in the world with Gnosis whatsoever. Okay, the knowledge is given, and then what you do with it is what you do with it. No one is going to ask you, are you practicing alchemy? Nobody asks that kind of stuff. Nobody wants to hear about that kind of stuff. We don't sit around and talk about those kind of experiences. Uh, if you want, if you have questions or something like that, there's definitely people that can answer your questions. Um, uh, that's one of the uh, neat things about coming to, to big events is you can meet other Gnostic people. So if you have a question and you can you know, find someone to, to maybe ask about that, but it's really a, a behind closed door sort of thing. It's not. There's no. There's no rituals involving like you know. I was having visions of you know 1970s orgies and everybody wearing robes and all this kind of stuff. I was like, oh, what did I get myself into? <laughs> and lying up the door, figuring if I need to run, how quickly can I get in that back door? It's it's really not like that. The knowledge is presented, and it's for you to make use uh, in your life how you want to make use of it. And nobody ever asks you. No one's going to check into you. Uh, it's just something else that you can do. Just like we give you tons of practices and. We don't talk about the practices. We don't say, let's all sit around and talk about our astral projection practices. How many times did you practice last week? Did you? No. It's just like a, that is just like a meditation. It was presented to you, and you can go home, you can reflect, and it's the same as all the other practices. Don't take my word for it. Don't take anyone's word for it. Practice, work with it, and see where you go. See what kind of experiences you have. So that's what the birth is all about. The birth was the birth of the solar bodies. Okay, the birth of the golden bodies. How do we achieve that? We achieve that through alchemy. Okay, the alchemical union of a man and woman. What's the definition of alchemy? Alchemy is basically uh, having intercourse to generate those energies and then not reaching the point of physical orgasm, reaching something much higher. Okay, something as well that's much more pleasurable, much more spiritual, that brings about a deeper love and a deeper connection with your partner that you cannot experience any other way than through the, the alchemical union. And it's a way to build a really you know, strong, long-lasting relationship is work with somebody on an alchemical level and develop those energies. The second factor is the factor of death. What is it that dies? This is, we've been talking about this already. It was the death of the ego. Okay, so when Jesus died on the cross, what was dying in him? It was, it was the ego. Okay, the first death is the death of the ego. We have to liberate the essence from the ego. This is only possible by dissolving the I. Remember, the ego traps the essence. The ego is like the chain that keeps us bound to this physical world. Okay, and as it's keeping us bound, it's literally feeding off of the various energies in our body, like the sexual energies. Because it's feeding off those energies, the higher self doesn't receive any of those energies, therefore the higher self can't develop. What happens is the physical body keeps getting drained and drained and drained, and that's where we see the process of, of you know, going from a baby to an adult to an older person. That's the process the physical body undergoes as all those different energies are constantly drawn out of it. We have to die within ourselves if we want illumination. The Gnostics want we pray for death. In Second Chamber, some of the bigger practices that we do, we do them on Saturdays. Why? Because Saturday is associated with the planet Saturn, and Saturn is the planet of death. What is it we want for? We pray for the death every day, but the death of the ego, the death of the false self, the death of the death of the dark side. Okay, so we can then give birth to the light. Because in the absence of the darkness, then the light can be born. If the seed doesn't die, the plant can't be born. Okay, that's, we, we don't have to go a change, we have to undergo a transformation. That's why this is a, a revolutionary path, we have to fight against this. The first thing we have to do is we have to cut off its food supply. Well, that's going to make it angry. <laughs> you know, it's going to fight back. But then we have to learn to dissolve the ego. Another interesting thing about alchemy that we'll get into later, we've talked about the process of the ego, right? The first step was observation. So we can then identify the egos. The second step was comprehension, fully understanding the mind, the third step was elimination. 
Well, guess how the elimination is reached? The elimination is reached through alchemy. Okay, that's why when you look at the, the version of the Divine Mother, Devi Kundalini, a lot of the, uh, like if you look at the uh, Indian culture, uh, the Divine Mother is often depicted with a belt of severed head standing on a severed corpse holding a bloody head with a sword. It seems like a horrific image, but all those severed heads were the eagles. The Divine Mother is the one that slays the eagles, and we fight back to the ego by using the energies of alchemy. Uh, we have to die moment to moment, practice something that's referred to as death in motion. We'll, get this, uh, we'll talk more about this later on, but ideally every day we want to be dying, a little bit at a time. Okay, not just once a day we meditate, not just a couple of days a week when you remember to self-observe, but as we go from moment to moment, day to day, we constantly want to be fighting the ego, so we slowly take energy away from the ego and direct the energy to our consciousness, our higher self. So over time, the ego starts to die as the consciousness starts to grow, and we completely reverse those two. We've already talked about how to die, we have to eliminate the ego. And that begins with discovering that it's there, which is why in phase A, the early stages, we talk about the importance of self-observation. Okay, self-observation is so important because if you don't know the ego's there, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. First step is self-observe to understand our egos. Once we've discovered egos, we then have to study them, comprehend them, find out why they exist and how they work and what energies are they taking and why and all that kind of stuff. Because once we fully comprehend an ego, then during alchemy that ego can be eliminated. We can fully take the energies away from it, redirect them to our consciousness, which causes the ego to die and our consciousness to grow. We're basically having to rewire the energy flow of our body, taking everything away from the ego and directing it back to the consciousness. Okay? So we self-observe to discover all our defects. An expression that Master Samael was famous for is must be alert like a sentry in a time of war because the ego really is like that. If you let your guard down, it's in there and it's already directing, influencing, and controlling what you do. It's always trying to be in the moment, be here and now, right in the present moment with that consciousness active. Okay, the second you slip into that dream state, the second you identify, become fascinated and sleep, then it's like opening a door and all the egos run in. Okay, we have to be alert like a sentry in a time of war, ready for an ego to manifest itself at any given point in time. If you're driving to work and you're not being alert like a sentry at a time of war, somebody cuts you off, you start swearing, you know, honk on the horn, give them the finger. But if you're trying to self-observe at that point, when they cut you off, you just simply don't have to react to them. You know, who knows, maybe uh, maybe uh, they were paying attention. Maybe they just got a phone call that their pregnant wife's giving birth in the hospital and they had to be in front of me because they have a place to go. There's no reason to react with anger. Uh, analyze each defect during meditation to fully comprehend it in all levels of the mind. Okay, it's not just simply going, yeah, I know I'm angry, but what happens when I'm angry? What triggers my anger? What effect does it have? Because once we fully comprehend an ego, then during alchemy, we're able to use those energies to, to destroy the ego. Okay, and when we think of our ego, if we're looking for help, if we're looking for strength, uh, the Divine Mother is the one that we can, we can pray to because it's the Divine Mother that has the, the, the power to help us work with our ego. Um, we'll explore more of this context later on when we look into Kundalini because the Divine Mother is Devi Kundalini, it is the, the Goddess Kundalini. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when we look at the depictions of the Divine Mother holding the severed heads, wearing the belt of skulls, I mean, that's symbolic. That energy force within us is basically the sexual energies. Our Divine Mother, as I said before in our meditations, it's, you can think of it as the creative aspect, the feminine creative aspect of our higher self, or the feminine creative aspect basically is the sexual energies. Uh, the third factor is sacrifice. So birth was the birth of the solar bodies through alchemy, transmutation of the sexual energies. The death was the death of the ego. And what was the sacrifice? Simply sacrifice for humanity. Okay. We must work to raise the torch of wisdom to illuminate the path for others. This relates to karma and relates to the flow of energy on a, a much greater level. Uh, when one works for others, we're rewarded. We cancel old karma from past lives. Okay, remember, he who helps others helps himself. Okay, if you want to receive, you need to give. He who helps others helps himself. You see, that's where I got that from, You're right there. Uh, we must give in order to receive. That's why any legitimate Gnostic school, the, the classes are free. Nobody's paying me for this. This is what I'm doing. This is my third factor. This is the work in my third factor. 
If I wish to receive knowledge, I have to impart what I've received already. If I want to, you know, help myself, then I have to help others around. Okay? We must work to raise the torch of wisdom to illuminate the path for others. And in that case, we help ourselves by dealing with our karma from past lives. Okay, it doesn't, you don't have to necessarily teach in the context of standing up in front of people and, and teach. It's not saying that if you want to awaken consciousness, you got to teach Gnostic classes. That's not the thing. It's just working to help others around ourselves. Okay, whether it's, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean simple charity, uh, shouldering your neighbor's driveway in the snow, but there's, there's different ways to help people when working for the benefit of humanity. And don't forget, too, uh, when we work on ourselves, we help others. Remember Gandhi, be the change you want to see in the world? That's part of that process as well. Uh, what is it that we give? We have to give wisdom and love. Um, not the 1960s hippie touch of feely love. It's not necessarily <coughs> that kind of love. It's a disinterested love for humanity, an understanding of humanity, a realization that we are all one and the same. You know, we're all one big family, and I can't go without helping you with me, basically, if you look at it that way. Uh, we must learn to love our fellow man. And this is something that I always personally had um, a problem with, just because I'm not touchy-feely to begin with, um, but also because I really didn't understand, like, you know, you're looking at, you know, people that, uh, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, people that are really violent and, you know, drug addicts, and I mean, how can you love people like that? I always had this, this problem with understanding what it really meant to, to truly love our fellow man that really prevented me from properly working in the sacrifice. Uh, we must do away with the eyes, the egos, of resentment, self-love, and desire for revenge, wanting to see others suffer. We, we carry that within ourselves. Remember, while we see ourselves on that pedestal as that golden idol, while we have that false image of the self, then I am better than all of you. It's not until I step off the pedestal and look at things properly and say, you know what, I'm no better than anybody else in this room. We're all the same. We're all, we all have the same problems, we all have the same egos, none of us are perfect. But let's see together what we can change in the world. But until we step off that pedestal, we'll never see that. Okay, because you look at a drug deal and it's, I'm better than them, they're scum of the earth is garbage. I just don't have a problem with ego and addiction, which is related to greed. Okay, if I truly understood how greed works, then perhaps I'd be able to look at them in a different light. Same thing when you see somebody who's angry and you're offended by the anger. If you truly have observed and studied anger in yourself, you don't need to react to anger in somebody else. It's not, what the hell is their problem? It's, <coughs> oh, anger's a tough one. I wrestled with that a lot. I've been there. When anger takes control, man, you do really stupid things. If somebody got angry and lashed out at you or did something or said something hurtful, you wouldn't react to those words. You wouldn't be offended because you know that right now they're exhibiting anger and anger makes people say and do stupid things. Soon that will pass, and then we'll be back to a different state, and we can work on the problem together or whatever. Um, uh, we're always concerned. Uh, sorry, we're always concerned with ourselves. We're always confined within our own egotism. That's that's the problem of having so much ego, which we do. We generally, as a society, the culture, we have a real me first attitude. And most people do, right? A me first and everybody else later sort of thing. Uh, we have to to learn to exhibit a true disinterested love and sacrifice. Helping humanity for the sake of helping humanity, not helping humanity for the sake of looking good in front of the people or that kind of thing. If we want happiness, we have to fight for the happiness of others. You know, if we want to awaken our consciousness, we have to fight so the consciousness of other people can be awakened. Same kind of idea. It is necessary to comprehend others and see their point of view if we want to know how to love. That's one of the keys. While we think we're better than everybody, while we think, you know, while we judge others, instead of judging ourselves, then we're in this situation. It's all talking about, you know, being able to turn the other cheek. You know, how do we really do unto others? How do we learn to turn the other cheek? It's all through understanding our ego. Really working with self-observation to fully understand the ego within us so we don't have to react or respond to the manifestation of ego in other people. Remember, when we're condemning and judging other people, what inside us is doing that? The consciousness doesn't condemn and judge. The ego condemns and judges. So I'm condemning and judging when criticizing what you're doing, and that's my ego criticizing your ego. Those are my imperfections measuring your imperfections. That doesn't even make any sense. Okay? 
we must learn to love even those who hate us. That's the idea of turning the other cheek, do unto others, all that sort of thing. How? We must comprehend ourselves and our defects so we can understand others when their defects manifest within them. Okay, that's one of the keys. Think of the story that I told you about Buddha. He's meditating under that tree, and the guy comes by and starts insulting him, and Buddha stops and opens his eyes and says, you know, my brother, what do you do when somebody gives you a gift that you don't want? Uh, the guy looks at Buddha and says, well, he's just telling me to take it back. And then Buddha says, well, thank you, take your gift and leave. Right, the idea being that everything that's directed at us is our choice whether you receive it or not. If someone's insulting us, if we get offended, it's because we've taken that insult and reacted to it. We can simply just return it and say we're not interested in that energy right now. And if you ever get the chance to study martial arts, a lot of martial arts are like that. You know, things like Kung Fu, the, the principle is you're not ever hitting anybody or lashing out at them. You're just choosing to not receive the energy directed at you and returning it back to them. So if you kick me and I kick you back, it's not that I'm kicking you, I'm just refusing to keep your kick and returning it to you. I said, there you go. Okay, that's the kind of the idea. It's, it's, it's the same sort of thing. Any questions about that? Yes. The, the third rule of sacrifice. Um, <coughs> now, uh, I'm I'm curious as to what. Uh, let's say someone lives their life completely consumed in the ego, mm -hmm. and if we were to go out of our way to help someone who's living off of their ego, would that not be helping their ego, and therefore not really helping at all? Well, that's the thing. That's why learning to help others begins with awakening our own consciousness, because. Uh, if we go back to the way, remember the karma class, I gave you that paradox, I said, okay, there's a homeless person and you give them money, and they use the money to buy drugs and overdose or buy a gun and shoot somebody, how much are you responsible for that? Remember, there's no point in doing good unless we truly know how to do it. And knowing to truly how to help somebody comes through awakening of consciousness. Because you're right, if I'm trying to help, if my ego is trying to help your ego, you know, what, what, what good is that? But learning to awaken the consciousness is then, we, we know how to help people, we know um, how to, to, to help steer people in the right direction. Once we found, you know, the, or experienced a little bit of the, the light, a little bit of the, the, the reality, a little bit of the truth, then we can help other people go in the same direction. But until then, we're all just stumbling around blindly in the dark, right? Blindly in the blind, so to speak. Yes? So does, does illumination, or the, um, coming out of the, the blind phase and mm -hmm. being able to see, uh, come from the um, realization that the others that are put on our path in this movie of life are in fact um, mirrors of ourself? There's, yeah, there's a lot of that, absolutely. And um, if we are to project them into this movie of life, whoever the other might be, mm -hmm. it's for the purpose of our own growth and because of what they mirror in, in us. Yeah. Is that? That yeah, and that's why we that's why the social interaction of life is one of the best places to discover egos you carry within yourself. And that's why shutting yourself in a cave and meditating by yourself for thirty years isn't gonna awaken consciousness. You become a master of meditation, you can experience all kinds of deep states of meditation, but it's all temporary. The second you open your eyes, you're back in your physical body. Also a comment uh, regarding uh, the um, uh, the alchemy mm -hmm. and um, um, I have uh, purchased a, a, a book, mm -hmm. a program by, attributed to um, Tibetan lamas, mm -hmm. and they're called the Five Sacred Rituals, mm -hmm. and um, basically they're yoga poses mm -hmm. to um, awaken the kundalini, or the forces, mm -hmm. the energy forces in the body. And there's a, and in this book it talks about a sixth sacred ritual. Um, with regards to the um, sex center and how when one has um, a lustful thought that uh, one can um, through breath work and exercise mm -hmm. um, raise the sexual energy and store it as you mm -hmm. use the analogy of the battery. We're going to get into those, look at those practices in a few weeks. There's, there's two in particular. One is an Egyptian pranayama and the other one is a breathing exercise. Um, we'll see later on too that um, you can work with your energies and transmute them. Not, you don't always have to be with a partner. That's the other thing too. Single people can raise the kundalini with exactly what you're describing. There's practices and breathing exercises that we can use to raise our energies in the body. We don't need the sex act to do that. That's something we can do on our own. One of the things I found interesting when you're talking about the death section, 
was we listen on Saturdays to Deepak Chopra's show on Sirius, mm -hmm. and he talks on the medical side about how your body regenerates, so in essence your cells die, and that's and death is a completely natural part of nature. Yeah. And that, you know, within, I, I forget what the numbers are, like within a month you have a new liver and your stomach and all, mm -hmm. all, and so essentially a year from now the body that you have now is dead and it's a completely new body and everything else like that. So you could argue that, you know, causing the egos to die is actually emulating these natural forces. Yeah. And there is now. Yeah, absolutely. And that yeah. idea that, you know, death is a natural process, it's a transition from one state to another. But ideally we'd like that trans transition to be linear, because we keep going from one state to another higher and higher, but instead it's, it's circular for us. When we develop a solar body in a dimension, like the astral, that basically gives us, you think, that basically gives us immortality in that dimension. That's why we need those solar bodies, because this physical body, it's product of time, it's going to wear out, it's not going to last forever. Okay, there are masters that can use the energies to sustain themselves for unnaturally long time. We've all heard the stories of some Tibetan monks somewhere that have lived to be 200 years old or 300 years old. Moses was said to live to 900 years. Was it 900 years old? I think it was 900 years old. Moses was supposed to be. Um, there are masters that can sustain the physical body for really long periods of time if they choose to. But for most people, the body it's a part of the time. So that's why we, when we develop the higher bodies, when the physical body is over, I'm just continuing on in the higher dimensions. This is just one level, and after this level is over, we continue climbing higher. But if we don't have those solar bodies to go into, when this physical existence is over, we got to wait for a new physical body and start the process again, which is the idea of reincarnation, or eternal recurrence coming back and back and back, because we don't have the permanent consciousness. That's why um, if you learn to after project, one of the exercises that you can do is you can find people that have recently deceased and you can find them in the astral and they're they don't know that they're there they don't realize that that they're 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 not in the physical anymore they're just there until they come back again into a new body they don't have the awakened consciousness they don't know that they're there and they can't see that they're in a different dimension just like when you dream you don't know that you're in a different dimension okay their consciousness is in that dream state because the ego is keeping them in that state when we eliminate the ego then there's no dream and we go on to develop the bodies in the higher dimensions that we use after this physical body is over. Yes? So, so you're, what you're saying is a, a disincarnate spirit um, who hasn't developed the higher bodies mm -hmm. um, isn't aware that they've left the body, that they're dead? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that goes for all disincarnate spirits? Well, not necessarily, because the, the ego knows, right? So you can have like, there's like different, not too much, there's like different ranges of being disincarnated depending on what's present. Because really the life force that's there, the essence, is being used by all the egos. For example, if you're doing, um, say, let's say you're doing, you know, uh, talking to a meme or something, and you're trying to talk to your, I don't know, you know talk to your, your grandmother. Um, that medium is going to channel some energy. There's a couple of different possibilities. Uh, sometimes, if your grandmother's essence was, was strong enough, it, it could speak to you in that moment to give you a message. A message that you know, everything's okay or whatever, or depending on what the message is. The other option is you're talking to the egos that were in your grandmother. And those egos, they would know because they're, they experience, they would know things about you and about her life that no one else would know. And the third option is you can be dealing with there's just negative entities in the higher dimensions that enjoy interacting with physical people. The third option when you're talking to your grandma is that it's not your grandma. It's intelligences, malevolent intelligences from the higher dimensions. You know what? Because the higher dimensions, everything, there is no time, they can see all of it. So they can tell you things about you and about your grandma that no one else would know. So a clairvoyant, for example, mm -hmm. you can see spirits. Mm -hmm. Um, could potentially be seeing uh, like a negative entity that's not, in fact, the spirit of the person you think they're seeing. Uh, potentially, yeah. Yeah, don't forget too that um, the personality that we have, when somebody is recently deceased and let's say they're seen you know, walking around their house or something, that's usually the personality. And that personality slowly deteriorates over time. That's why oftentimes too, when 
we see ghosts. They look like the person dressed in the same clothes, walking in the same paths, or doing the same things, or carrying the same stuff. That's called a landlocked spirit, one who doesn't know that they've crossed over. Yeah. But um, I thought landlocked spirits was one, one category. Uh, think think of landlocked spirit as kind of, if it's just a personality, and that will fade with time. That just dissipates with time, just like the physical body deteriorates with time and the, and the ground. That personality will deteriorate in time as well, or even just the egos and the essence in the higher dimensions, which would then reincarnate into a new body. When you start talking about like malevolent things, like poltergeists and stuff like that, now you're talking about intelligences, entities from the higher dimensions messing with the lower dimensions. They're not necessarily people that have just died. There's just stuff up there that likes to do things like that. So there's malevolent intelligences in the higher dimensions that you can encounter. It doesn't mean that they're disincarnated spirits of a recently deceased human. It just means there's energy up there that likes to do things and, you know, fear is an energy. And if they can make you afraid, they can feed off of those energy. We'll talk more about that when we look at the astral projection classes, because that's when we start getting into negative entities and things that can happen when you're wandering around the astral. That's when we start talking about the different types of things that you can run into.